Well, hello and welcome to this week's Bible study. Uh, this week we'll be taking on the very interesting challenge of uh, working through 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, at least beginning the, beginning the chapter. So let's start with prayer. Our Father, we're grateful and we're thankful for all you've done for us and we're thankful how you've blessed us with the opportunities and the abilities to study your word. And we pray that these great teachings in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 will be of benefit to us as Christians. Forgive us when we fail you. Love us always, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, we're going to be uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, interesting chapter. I guess by, by way of introduction to the chapter, this chapter begins a, 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 a new uh, division of the book of 1 Corinthians. Up, everything up to this point, chapters 1 through six, uh, have been a response uh, by the great apostle to a letter written to him by the, the people of Chloe, uh, who is likely a, a member of the church there, uh, regarding uh, problems in the church, I guess you would say. At this point now, I mean, that was, that was one letter that Paul was dealing with. At this point, it would appear, based on what we're going to find here in verse, uh, in verse one, is that the, the church itself has written Paul a, a, a separate letter uh, with questions regarding marriage, uh, divorce, remarriage, etc. A whole series of things. And the great apostles are going to give a teaching on that. Now, uh, with the exception of what Jesus spoke uh, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 9, regarding the only way that, that Christians can remarry uh, is through uh, adultery, fornication within the marital. Uh, bound. So uh, Paul, I guess you would say, is giving a supplemental teaching here. I don't think there's anything in this that's going to be uh, contradictory, of course, with what the Savior has taught. Both carry an equal weight in my mind. Uh, Jesus, of course, being the Son of God, uh, clearly uh, gives eternal teachings. Paul, in this particular case, is going to be speaking uh, from, from the apostolic position. Uh, and both of those will have uh, the inspiration of the Spirit, and both of those will be, uh, w without question, gospel, without question, uh, scripture. Uh, so let's pick up uh, there in the chapter. Now, you know, one thing I do want to say, uh, if you turn over to Acts chapter 7, and then look at the 26th verse, there, there's something there that's very important for you to understand, because it's this it's this ominous, overriding theme that, that goes with this particular chapter. And that theme being the, uh, the beginning and the probably happening then at some level amount of persecution that the church was under. And, and listen to what the Paul wrote. And again, this is in, ch in, in chapter 7, verse 26. He said, I think that it is good. And listen to this because this is the important part. In view of the present distress... That present distress is this insane amount of persecution that's taking place in the church. And the apostle giving all these teachings, giving all this, this insight, that kind of has an overriding umbrella effect on, on all of this because that, that is impactive in a way that's unique to the situation there. So some of this we can apply. Some of this certainly has to have the, the influence of that uh, in, in the teaching uh, but again, it's very difficult. The other piece of this, which is equally as challenging, is the fact that here is, here is a letter where we have the answers, but we don't have the questions. Okay, The, the questions that were, were going to be from this letter that was sent uh, were lost to time. Uh, and not preserved, obviously. So that in itself makes it a little bit interesting. It's kind of like listening to one side of a phone conversation. You know, you're hearing some response, but you're almost having to kind of assume what the question was. And that makes it equally as challenging as we kind of work down through these difficult things. This being the most elaborate and extensive piece of teachings on marriage and divorce, marriage and divorce within the, the, the world today, uh, the religious world today within the New Testament. Uh, the temptation is to try to apply it in every manner. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but it is, it is important an important teaching, obviously. So let's pick up in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. We'll probably get down through, oh, about, uh, I think verse 17 is my, is my goal today, which is about halfway, about halfway through, the, through the teaching. 
So, now concerning the things about which you wrote, okay, you hear that? Now that's different from what he had gotten from the household of Chloe. This is something that comes from the church. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, so obviously a letter from Paul about some questions regarding marital situations. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, keeping in mind this, this, this verse about 26, all this overriding situation where, where you had this impending persecution, Paul is going to give throughout this particular teaching the importance of celibacy. But I think he's going to recognize that in probably 99% of the world, that just doesn't work. Uh, and if you go all the way back to Genesis 2nd chapter, verses 18, God himself said it, that it's not good for a man to be alone. And he made himself, he made him a helpmate. Uh, so, you know, you kind of got to balance those two things. Paul's view on celibacy here is where you are focusing only on the the church, only on Christ, only on the gospel, only on the way. Uh, and, and for some that will work, but for the vast majority of us that will not work. So it kind of starts off with that. It is good for a man not to take such a woman, but, I mean, he just immediately clarifies that, but because of immoralities, and some, and some will say fornications, and that's improper sexual relationships between man and woman outside of the marriage bond. Uh, because of immorality, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. And, I, and boy, the word have there is a strong word. That's almost a, I guess you would say, almost to the level of an apostolic command. Uh, and that's the plan. There's, there's, there's no polygamy prescribed or anything along those lines that's, that's tolerated or allowed within the New Testament. God made a helpmate for him, a single woman, single man. In this particular case, Paul says, man to have a woman, woman to have a man. That's the relationship which is prescribed in the New Testament. Now that's contrary to some uh, culturally uh, in the world today, and it was contrary to the culture of the time. But that is, that is coming directly from the New Testament, and that is where we get our source for authority in, in our lives. Verse 3, The husband must fulfill his duty to the wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Now, I think what the, the great apostles is teaching here is don't take the temptation to somehow weaponize sexual relations within the marriage. Uh, God gave a man and a woman this ability to satisfy each other, and that is preeminent. Uh, and it can't be one or the other using that relationship, that piece of the relationship, uh, to their advantage, you might say. Uh, taking advantage of, 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 of the desires that, that men and women have. And, and I think that's what's Paul here. The woman must fulfill his, or the husband must fulfill his duty sexually to the wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And he continues that on because he, he then effectively creates, the, and he's used this same idea about our, our body being that of, of, of God's earlier or in the last chapter. He's kind of going to use that same analogy here uh, when he's talking about the marital relationship between men and women. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. And, and I love the way the great apostle is, is, is kind of taking this and saying, all right, in this matter of sexual relations between the spouses, the desires of each are preeminent over our own desires. Uh, the spouse, the, the, the wives is preeminent over the husband. The, women, the husbands is preeminent over, preeminent over the wives. It's very important that, that Paul is giving this teaching. And this, along with many other things that we've, we, that we've talked about in this particular study so far in 1 Corinthians, very likely were influenced by some false teachings that they were getting uh, just from the inference of, of the way the question... Again, the, the great challenge for this is, is is we know the answer, but we don't know the question. And we don't know the reason for the question or the background behind the question. So we've just got to kind of make inferences and assumptions that, that are logical that support the text. And, and that one would be a, a strong indication there. Verse 5, stop depriving one another. Now, we're going to learn in verse 6 that this is optional, but this is kind of the exception for depriving each other of the sexual relationships between a husband and a wife. So listen to what Paul says. And again, the only thing that he's prescribing here is something that's focused directly on the Father, directly on God. So listen to what he says. Stop depriving one another, 
verse 5, except for a time, and you may devote yourselves to prayer, and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of control. But I say this by way of concession, not by way of command. Now, I love the way the, the great apostle gives this allowance to, to it's, it's almost kind of like fasting. Uh, we, we, have, we have some teachings in the New Testament regarding fasting, but fasting itself is not bound upon the church. This is not bound upon the, the, the marital relationship between a husband and, life, husband and wife. But if it does happen, it's okay. I mean, we, we have the authority to, to separate in, in, in what, by way of agreement for a period of time, but then come back together uh, so that we don't have temptation on either party. Uh, I love the way he does that. So we begin then uh, continue on uh, verse 7. And again, this is where we get the first indication from the great apostle that due to the impending or taking place, we're probably in the early stages of the great persecution that's going to befall the church, he's going to give a specific teaching. But again, the, it, it, I don't think at all he's saying that that if we decide to marry, that is morally inferior by any stretch of the imagination. But Paul is just saying, listen to what he says in, in verse 7. Listen to what he says. Yet I wish that all men, or even as I myself, celibate at this particular case. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. So basically he's saying, if it is your gift to be able to practice celibacy, uh, the idea of, of not having a spouse and being able to control your sexual urges, focus only on Jesus, focus only on the gospel, focus only on the church, that is a great gift. But if you don't have that one, it's, nothing, it's, no, it's no big problem. You have other gifts. That's the idea that he's teaching here. Again, the celibacy that Paul was, 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 uh, was promoting here was just only for the advantage of God, only for enhancing the kingdom. And in those particular cases, he, he does feel like it is. And he's going to kind of repeat that again, but always with this kind of this disclaimer, you might say. The next verse, verse 8, we kind of change to a kind of a different question. Uh, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, but that it is good for them to remain as I am, again, Paul giving this idea that if you can remain celibate, if you can remain outside the marriage bounds, that's not the bad thing. But let us never forget Genesis 2 verse 18 where God himself says, it is not good for a man to be alone. And the, infer, the, the inverse of that is true. It is not good for a woman to be alone. And the next verse Paul is going to clarify that. Listen to what he says. But, verse 9, if they do not have self-control, if they are not able to control their sexual urges, what good might be done by remaining celibate and focusing on the church is overrun by the damage that it does to you spiritually because of fornication or adultery. I mean, that's the idea that he's given. But, if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. I mean, that's the, that's the, 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 the essence of this, this entire discussion here. If you can, great. But, which again, a large majority of the population would not, be, would not have the capacity to do that. I've known a few that'll do, but it's rare. Then you should marry and, 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 and be in that relationship where you don't burn with passion, risk adultery, risk fornication, rich, risk the kind of sin that would that would be detrimental to your salvation. Uh, great teaching. Verse 10, when we start into verse 10. Now, this is kind of a, the next question. And I probably didn't mention this at the beginning, but there are a series of six questions effectively that Paul is answering here. Uh, first one was about the first uh, seven verses. Then the second one was verses uh, 8 and 9. And we're starting with the third one here. This is verses 10 and 11. And this is probably the most challenging, I think, in my mind of each of them, where where Paul is, is talking about people who have been divorced and their, their ability or opportunities to remarry. Now, keep in mind, go back to Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 9. The Savior himself gave the single allowance for remarriage when the marriage bond is broken. Uh, and that would be because the other party was unfaithful and practiced adultery, uh, fornication within the marriage. That is the only reason. And Paul is not going to, to usurp that, but he's going to kind of clarify uh, that in, in the next few verses. So, and again, 
he, he's going to say something here in these, these next couple of verses where he's going to talk about a teaching that Jesus gave. That is not to say that what he is teaching is not equally binding as far as a teaching from Scripture because Paul is speaking apostolically. He was an apostle and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit uh, in an extraordinary fashion and speaking. And, and earlier he, in, in the book of, of the book of 1 Corinthians, he said, when I speak, it is after... It is as if Jesus was speaking. So that's the authority by which he had. But here in this particular case, he's just going to give credence to what the Savior had said earlier back in the Gospels. Again, Matthew 19, verse 9. Listen to what he says here in verse 10. But to the married, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord. I mean, so he's, he's basically not it, it, placing any more value on He's just giving credence to the fact that this was something that the Savior had. That a woman should not leave her husband. Okay, now Jesus, again, did give one scenario where a woman could divorce and remarry, and that was adultery. But Paul's not alluding to that here because it was probably not a part of the question. But to the married I give these instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the woman should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, this is the important part, if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and that her husband should not divorce the wife. So basically, he, he put this thing both ways. Uh, if you dissolve your marriage, if you, if you divorce your spouse for anything other than unchastity, adultery, fornication, you can't remarry. I mean, that's, that's the depth of this sermon. Now, the question is always going to come up, is this speaking only to Christians? Is it speaking to others? Is it speaking to mixed? We don't have the question. We just have the answer. We can take what we can from this scripture uh, and try to apply it. Uh, but in some of these cases, someone involved in this situation will need to study and interpret for themselves. I, I don't think that there's some things that I can give you the answer for. Uh, I have my opinion, but that is all that it is. So I'm not going to, to go into that. But... Clearly, at least in the scenario where we're talking about a Christian family, if you divorce for anything other than for anything other than adultery, you can't remarry. The purpose being God's intent for those two to reconcile. Uh, boy, this has been a this has been one of the most difficult pieces of scripture in in uh, in, the, in the history of the church uh, because these are these are. These are relationships that are passionate. They're, they're, they destroy families. They destroy lives. And when these things happen, it becomes very difficult. So, boy, I, I encourage you, if you're going through situations like this, have family or friends that are going through situations like this, study it thoroughly. Get a lot of insight from, from great writers of the New Testament uh, or great writers of commentaries of the New Testament who have good insight. Uh, and, just, and just come to the conclusion that you need to, that you need to reach. But it is difficult. Absolutely no question. Verse 12 uh, begins the fourth question. Again, we don't know the question, but we know the answer, which, which kind of makes it uh, a little bit challenging. So, But to the rest, I say, not the Lord. And, and again, don't think that Paul is putting any less importance on his teaching than what Jesus said. He's just, he's just making sure that this came from Jesus and this comes from me, Jesus being the Son of God, me being an inspired apostle, both carry Scripture important. So, let's pick up in verse 12. But to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. So, just because you're married as a Christian to an unbeliever does not give you any extra ability to divorce her or him, and he's going to clarify that, just because they're not a Christian. If the non-believer is willing to live with the believer, then the bindings that Paul has just just given apply. Only adultery separates it. But he continues on, and this is an important one because, again, we're talking about here, we're talking about Christian and pagan, Christian and non-believer. Uh, so now he goes into verse 13. And the woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. So man... Christian, woman, not Christian, you stay if she wants to stay. Woman, Christian, man, non-Christian, she stays if he wants to leave being the non-believer. And then Paul gives a little bit of insight on this. But the believing husband is sanctified through the wife. Now, I think a lot of times when we use that word sanctified, we, we always want to apply that from the perspective of, of forgiveness of sins. I, I don't think that's what Paul is teaching here. I think he's teaching that the marriage itself is sanctified before God. 
Uh, but the, the, a non-believer has not confessed his sins. He's not been baptized and washed him away. We're not talking about being holy before God as far as your sins are concerned. It's, it's the, marriage, the marriage union that is sanctified. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. I mean, kind of whichever way it applies. The marriage is sacred before God if they remain together. Uh, and then he continues on and he talks a little bit about the children. And let's talk. Let's, let's go into that. But otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Now, I would interpret that as talking about legitimate versus illegitimate. You know, in our culture today, marriage is, is, is so almost infrequent in, in the culture, it seems, that the illegitimate child is... It, it doesn't seem to be as much a concern to society, to, to the culture. It's at the time when Paul was teaching this, an illegitimate child was an extreme... It, it was very bad specifically for the child because they were not going to be able to fit in culturally or socially. It was going to be a considerable problem, this, this idea of illegitimacy. Children outside of the sacred marriage bond. So... Again, in our culture today, we may not have as well as much of an understanding or appreciation for that as they did back then. But from God's perspective, from God's perspective, it's very important. 15. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, and this is where it gets really challenging. If the unbelieving one leaves, whether that's the wife who's an unbeliever or the husband who's an unbeliever. If the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, the question must be, does this teaching of Paul now supersede what Jesus had gave, where he said the only reason to be able to remarry is because of fornication, because of adultery? Is Paul expanding and overriding that? Personally, I don't think so. I don't. I think he is just allowing this to take place. The purpose and the intent for, for Paul and for God is that there be a reconciliation. But does it give us permission to remarry? It would be my personal feelings, no. But again, that that is another place that you need to study and understand for yourself. It's a very difficult piece of Scripture to comprehend. Uh, but... In my mind, I just can't see that it's proper for the Apostle Paul to contradict the Savior and his very clear teaching. It continues on. And, and, and keep in mind, uh, this, next, this next piece of Scripture uh, in verse 16 will be very much a, uh, the same teaching that Peter's going to give in, 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 in 1 Peter. And we're going to go look at that here in just a second. Verse 16, For how do you know, O wife, that you will save your whether you whether you will save your husband or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? I mean, that's the purpose. That that is the the intent of staying together, even when one's a Christian and one's not. Even though it's difficult, it's, it's not as simple as if if both are, are of the same faith. But when when one is not and, and one is a Christian, it becomes almost an opportunity for missionary work. I mean, for for the ability to. To, to teach the gospel. And, and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, because I, I really like the way Peter the way Peter said this. 1 Corinthians, I'm so, I'm so sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 because the exact same teaching of what Paul had just given. Let's, let's reread Paul's in verse 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Question mark. Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Christian influencing the the non-Christian. Listen to the teaching Peter gave over in First Corinth or First Peter chapter three verse one. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are no are disobedient, not Christian, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by your behavior as their wives. I mean exact same teaching the opportunity for a christian to influence a non-christian to save their soul i mean that's that's the essence of the of the of the gospel that's the essence of of, of any of our relationships in the marriage if, if we don't have a believing spouse outside with friends uh, 
in the end, the, the, the goal is to influence them to see Jesus and to, to understand the importance of, of faithfulness and, and following His commandments. Uh, I can I get again I guess you'd say the the missionary possibility uh, that's within the that's within the relationship. We're going to stop there. Uh, Paul is going to at this next point for about oh looks like verses 17 through 24. He's going to take a bit of a uh, oh I, I guess you'd say a divergence here and he's going to apply these these principles that he's been talking about in these answers to these questions toward other relationships. Uh, uh, relationships with, with circumcision, relationships within slavery, uh, and that's that's kind of a, a, a bit of a drawn out discussion. We'll pick up that in our, in our next class. But but again, so we've answered four of the six questions that, that Paul has uh, that Paul has been posed by the church there in Corinth. So we'll continue on with this. Uh, very interesting chapter next week as we, as and hopefully hopefully we can get through uh, the remainder part of uh, of chapter of chapter seven next week. Uh, let's uh, let's say a prayer. Our God, we're so thankful that you that you love us and you give us insight as to your will. These teachings in First Corinthians seven are are challenging. Uh, relationships between spouses are amongst the most precious that we have and they are they are so important and we pray that as they are they are fractured and 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 struggling or people are fractured and, and struggling with those relationships these will give them insight about your will when we fail and we for, and we sin we pray that you will be merciful and forgive we're thankful for this great promise that you have bless each one of us our god and and love us we pray and it's through your son jesus name that we pray amen